Welcome to the School for Good Living podcast. I'm your host, Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this podcast to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. Most of my guests are authors, and in each episode, I explore their life journeys and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read so that you can use these same strategies and tactics too. So if you have a mission, a message, and the motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. Welcome to the School for Good Living. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Uh, Pleasure. I love what you've done with the place. (laughs) Well, thank you. So, Bob, there's so much I want to ask you about from your travels to your trivia to your philanthropy, but I want to start with kind of a big philosophical question first by asking, what's life about? Oh, my. What is the meaning of life? Well, let's let's go right to it. I actually have an answer to that. I think um, it's pretty much, I think our lives take on, take, takes on meaning to the extent that our actions and our beliefs actually like match. And uh, a lot of times if people are feeling purposeless at work or rudderless in their career or not sure what's going on with the relationship, there's just a, a disconnect between those two. There's no one meaning for life. There's seven billion of them. Um, and uh, hopefully that involves doing good for other people. Otherwise, you're a terrible person. And, uh, but most of the people watching this, I'm sure, are wonderful. Uh, and so it's really the trick is about figuring out how to arrange your life more and more in a way, and this can take years, it can take a lifetime, I'm still working on it, so that your work and your actions and your love and your, your everything in your personal life, it, it actually is all fitting with your beliefs. That's, that's my answer. Hope you, okay, see ya, bye-bye. <laughs> no, I love that, and, and I, I actually had that as a note in your book, uh, The International Bank of Bob, to ask you about, because the sentence, and you wrote it a few different times, in slightly different ways, but essentially saying the same thing, that your thesis is that life takes on meaning to the degree that our efforts and love are connected. Yeah, yeah, that's another way of saying the exact same thing. That's actually a better way of putting it, which is why it's in the book. Um, <laughs> that, that's a much better way of putting it, yeah. Our love, our, our you know, the, the part of our heart that lives outside of ourselves uh, and our ability to then work toward that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, people get it. I mean, the thing is, everybody watching this or listening to this has a pretty similar heart, probably. So you probably already know what we're talking about, and have, or at least have a deep sense of it. Oh, I, lo- I love that. It's beautiful. When somebody asks you who you are and what you do, I know this might change by context or who's asking, mm-hmm. but generally, what do you tell them? My business card, actually, uh, because I've done a bunch of different things. I, uh, currently, my day job is screenwriting, and I do you know, the TV development, travel writing, and I write books and I do a bunch of different things. So writer is usually the thing. Um, am I allowed to curse, mild cursing on the sure. podcast? All right. Um, my, uh, uh, my business card actually just says Bob Harris, purveyor of next level shit. Um, and it, it, that usually just opens up a, a conversation. People say, well, what, what does that mean? What do you do? And then depending on the social context, if I'm at uh, uh, some charity thing, then I can talk about the latest things that I've heard about or that are really cool. Or if I'm writing a thing or a a Hollywood deal, then I can talk about the current project that I'm doing. Um, So I don't really have a way to sum up my life in one simple, you know, a a writer more than anything else. That's what I, on health insurance forms, I fill up writer. That would would be all. So talking about next level and what's coming. um, I mean, you've been out around the world. It's probably increased even since you wrote the International Pink of Bob, I think. Mm At that count was somewhere around 70 countries. Yeah, I've lost count. It's somewhere in the 80s now. And, you know, that all, all depends on whether or not you want to do you count the Cook Islands. Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, they're <laughs> administered, they're like militarily defended by New Zealand. They don't have a UN seat, but they have a flag and an anthem. I don't know. So it's somewhere between 80 and 90 countries at this point. During those years of travel and mm-hmm. being in so many places, interacting with so many people, how many times did you ever fear for your physical safety? I've been asked this a number of times. Um, believe it or not, basically never. Um, uh, honestly, I, 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 it's hard to explain this because you see the television and you, you turn on uh, the TV news is basically just a daily chronicle. Well, until, to be honest with you, until Trump got elected. 
Now it's a daily chronicle of whatever the hell he just tweeted. And now here's a panel of experts to try to sort out reality because what the hell. Um, but prior to that point, the news was essentially a chronicle, and it still is to a large extent, of what blew up today, what's on fire, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, who's shooting who, and, 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 and all presented so far out of context that it's completely impossible to understand anything. You can't really understand a lot unless you go really deep into detail on any one of these many conflicts or issues around the world. Meanwhile, the world is populated, the actual human beings here, it's about 7 billion people who want to make better lives for their kids and a very small number of psychopaths in almost every country. And uh, that doesn't change. And so you can be in a horrific dictatorship and the kids play football and the soccer. They, you, you play with them, they, people drink tea, you hang out, it's a beautiful day. And yes, the laws are really a mess and the government's awful, but the people are the same. And so I've been in, and I said this in the book, I've been in places where I really felt like, okay, this is gonna be scary. Uh, I was in, uh, well, the first time I went to Beirut, I, I mean, when I was in college, um, Islamic Jihad, which is, uh, I think, a predecessor of, uh, of Hezbollah, was in the kidnapping Americans and occasionally beheading them business. And so I would watch the TV news when I was in my, you know, late teens and early 20s of Lebanon, big, scary place. I got to Beirut, and now, honestly, some of my dearest friends in the world are in Beirut. It's a beautiful city that has tremendous difficulties and real trouble. But once you're there and you're actually with people, that said, there are places I won't go. Um, I mean, I don't go to Iraq. I don't spend a lot of time in Syria. Uh, I, you know, there's, I can make a list of 20 or 30 places that I would no. say are just no-goes. North Korea, Central African Republic, a bunch of places. But um, I, was, I was just astonished at how... And the resilience of human beings, too, and this is digressing from your question, but uh, I was in a lot of places uh, when I was writing the book that had, were recovering from war, even genocide, the worst things that ever happened. And I'd meet the kids, and the next generation is still born fresh. They're still born, and their parents can teach them the hatred, but while they're young, there's, they're, just, they're just like you and me. I mean, there's no difference. And to walk, what I'm feel incredibly lucky about is that I got to see that, learn it, and know it for the rest of my life. And so now I try to put that in other people's brains and hearts too. So here, yeah, hey. I love that perspective. And I myself have been to nearly 70 countries. And, and yeah. that's one of the things that, that I wish I could share. Like I wish there's places, you know, that I could beam people like to the mm -hmm. rainforest or, you know, I did have the opportunity to visit North Korea for 24 hours, 10 years ago. So it was really a little different than, and, and like you, I mean, I had a chance, I was invited to go to Syria just about a year ago and oh, I wow. declined a friend went and came back. But I mean, your book, so I've seen that right about mm -hmm. that people are people, you know, we all bleed red. We all want the same things. Basically we all want to be warm. We want to be loved. We want to matter. You know, we want the best mm -hmm. for our kids. And that, I love that that came through in your book, um, The International Bank of Bob. And to be honest, I hadn't realized when I invited you to be on this show that you had written Who Hates Whom. But oh, tell me yeah. a little bit about why you, why did you devote enough energy to write an entire book about that? Oh, yeah. Who Hates Whom is a book, it's about 10 years old now. Uh, about, it's a, it's, it's a short, it's, it's humorous short summaries of, at that time, all of the major conflicts in the world. So, you know, because what happens again, you watch the television, and at the time, TV news was a bigger deal than it is now. Um, you, you, you know, you get a two minute report of whatever just exploded in, you know, checks, notes, look up country without any of the context. And a lot of these conflicts aren't actually that tremendously complex. Um, if they were, it'd be really hard to recruit people to fight them, you know. Uh, if, if, hey, why should I go kill that guy? The answer to that, if that's an essay question, nobody's going to go do the killing. So you've got to have a really simple answer. So there are a lot of conflicts at their root are actually based on pretty simple sets of emotions. So, okay, let's look at the history. And I did just boatloads of research to boil it all down in like 1,500 word uh, chapters, basically. Uh, and truthfully, it was meant to be a reference book for the reader, but also, honestly, it was intended to be something that would sit on the shelves in newsrooms. Because the people on television who play reporters on television are people on television playing reporters to a very large extent. They look great. They're spokesmodels who were reading the latest press releases. 
but do they actually know what's going on? Google Wolf Blitzer Jeopardy. And you'll see just how much that man knows about the world. When Wolf Blitzer played Celebrity Jeopardy, he got dusted by, um, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? The guy who played Andy Barker PD. It was a Cohen, Cohen, Cohen O'Brien sidekick. I forget his name, Andy, Andy Richter. Dusted him. Wolf Blitzer actually had the second lowest score in the history of the show. Wow. Uh, negative something or other. So they don't actually know nearly as much as they sort of pretend to. They're playing it on TV. And so I wanted there to be a book that could sit on their shelf. So, oh, something blew up in Ecuador. And then they can, oh, here's the context. And then take it on the air and actually have some clue, which as a grand plan to change the world didn't really have nearly the effect that I had hoped. But I have seen it actually on shelves in, in newsrooms more than once. So what the heck? That's got to be gratifying. Yeah, it was nice. It was nice. I'm not sure anyone opened it, but it was there. there it was. <laughs> so... Let's see. Speaking of Jeopardy, that's one thing I want to ask you about. I know, and, and this thing about your phone, phone a friend answer. Oh, that I'm a millionaire. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, um, so that was the quarter million dollar question, uh -huh. right? Yeah. You yeah. helped a friend answer because yeah. you knew it before he even read you the multiple choices. Yeah. Yeah. That was fun. How did that story end? Oh, um, it ended with him. Um, he, he actually, that was the, he, 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 uh, after I hung up the phone, um, and to back up, I was a phone a friend for uh, my friend uh, Howard Johnson was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire in 2005, six, seven, somewhere around there. And uh, he was sitting there in the hot seat with Meredith Vieira in the daytime. Uh, $250,000 on the line to get this phone call. And fortunately, it was something that I knew cold because I read it in Mad Magazine when I was like 11 years old. Honest to God, it was about Norman Mailer stabbing his wife with a pen knife. And I didn't know what a pen knife was, and I'm like 11, so I thought he just stabbed her with a pen. And he was a writer, and I thought that was, it just sort of stuck in my head. It's like, wow, <laughs> writers go around stabbing people with their pens? Is no wonder you wanted to be a writer. writer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, how I, it's how I really get all the anger out. Um, and uh, so it just happened to me in my head, and it was lucky. So Howard, uh, uh, the next question he didn't know, he, he quit the game with $250,000. Uh, went back to Illinois, continued with his career as a writer. Uh, it paid off. I mean, there was like, he had expenses. I won't get into his private life, but it changed his financial situation dramatically. And um, yeah, he sent me a really nice gift. And it was, it's a wonderful little, little small chapter. It was really fun. That's so um, great. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and you've had your own time on trivia on quiz shows on Jeopardy. I understand you're mm -hmm. a five time champion. Five. Yeah, come on. I am insulted. Is it more? Yeah. Well, when I was on uh, in 97, they would retire you after five games. But um, uh, and then, you know, then they bring in. They were afraid that people would get bored of having the same champion. And then they changed that rule after I was on the show, which is why Ked Jennings and these other young whippersnappers can go on these long runs. You know, we had to walk to Jeopardy through two feet of snow. And uh, it was a different world then. So but I've since been back for a bunch of invitational tournaments. So I've been on the show 14 times now. And I don't know how much I've won because I'm not that. I don't actually care. It's, it's a lot of money, so whatever. Um, uh, and uh, I've, I remember now, memory boy, Jeopardy. Uh, I've, I've won eight games and actually lost six times. I oh, actually wow. have lost on Jeopardy more often than anyone else alive. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much. Very That's the that. Babe Ruth at bats, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. That's yeah. beautiful. You only get, you only get, that's a really great, thank you for that. I, I lose that from here out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I know this book, I didn't read it, uh, The Prisoner of Trebekistan. Yeah. But yeah. tell me a little bit about that book and why you wrote it. Oh, well, that's a book about Jeopardy, as you probably guessed from the, uh, the, the name. Again, it's about 10 years ago, um, having been on the show a bunch of times. Uh, and I was, at the time, one of the more memorable contestants because I had a lot of fun on the show. That's why they always brought me back for invitational tournaments. Most people get up there and it's dead serious and rigid. And I, I'm used to being on stage. I've been on stage my whole life. So I'm actually on the stage. I've been on stage more than Alex has. So I'm up there and it's just home. It's like no big deal. There's no stress. So I'm having a great time. And I'm also aware that if I'm really obviously relaxed and having a great time, it actually makes the other players even more nervous. So I'm petty. And uh, so I just have a, have a great time with it. And at that time, after I'd been on the show a bunch, um, uh, Random House offered me a boatload of money to write about it. I said, well, okay. And uh, so I wanted, my niece and nephew 
at the time were uh, at an age where I wanted to teach them the mnemonic skills that I used to memorize all the stuff for Jeopardy. Mm -hmm. So that's actually snuck into uh, chapter five and chapter seven, both have stuff in the book about how do you remember all that stuff. It's actually not that complex. And subsequent to that, I've done uh, uh, college and corporate uh, talks about memory skills and performance under pressure and stuff like that ever since, which has been a really nice side benefit. And it's also the, the book is what it's actually about though, isn't the show and it's not memory stuff. What it's really about is it's a precursor to the international bank of Bob. When I was studying for jeopardy, all of a sudden the whole world started opening up to me that I never thought that I would be really interested in. Uh, suddenly I cared about art and architecture and, uh, all these exotic places that I was reading about and history and Shakespeare. And it was all suddenly like really cool. And I hoped that someday I would be able to get out and see the world. And then when the Bank of Bob book rolls along, you know, whatever it is, uh, eight years later, nine years later, I did. So you can actually read Trebekistan and it's like the pupa phase of uh, the, the, the Bank of Bob book. I walked in the front of door of Jeopardy hoping to win fabulous cash and prizes. And what I actually won was interest in the world and incredible friends. Uh, the people who do well on Jeopardy are not brainiacs. They're not, they're just really normal people with insatiable curiosity and a lot of playfulness. And a lot of my current friends to this day are people that I met at the green room in Jeopardy uh, or in the green room at Jeopardy. Um, and uh, tomorrow night, I'm going to go actually go down to a pub and, and do trivia with, uh, uh, three of the other people on the little pub trivia team are fellow Jeopardy champs and we're wow. going to crush people like flies. Yeah, that's like That'll not even fair. <laughs> it's not, actually. You guys have like your own is... bowling league shirts when you, when you walk in and everything? <laughs> that's not a bad idea. That's actually pretty fun. Um, <laughs> last week, I, I, I actually haven't done it very much for the last few years. I've been too busy, but I've been in Los Angeles for a little while. So I went last week and um, there's this pub in Santa Monica that has trivia nights on Wednesdays. And since LA has a bunch of Jeopardy former players and so on. They actually have a prize in their pub trivia for the team that doesn't have a Jeopardy champ on it. Oh, wow. The team that does the, but they, they win a prize. Uh, we sit around and, and by the way, I'm not in the, I'm not, when I sit at the table with like Brad Rutter and Pam Mueller and, and those people, I'm Shemp. Okay. I don't mean to put myself quite like Brad's incredible. Pam's brilliant. There's a bunch of people who are in a whole other level beyond me. And I don't pretend to be at that level for what it's worth. Well, that, that whole thing about, because um, Ken Jennings' book, Brainiac, and he talks ab about some of these strategies and things. And, and, you know, I thought maybe this was like just a gift. And I think it, I think it is a gift, but not just mm. a gift, right? Mm. For you to do well, for anyone to do well. But will you talk with me a little bit about what you have learned and how you prepared like to be to do well on Jeopardy and how that translates mm -hmm. to like real life for, oh, for sure. Others. How can they apply that? Sure. I see. I, I never would have imagined that like that Jeopardy would then lead to like actual real life skills or something like that. Um, yeah. But uh, when I first got the call for the show, I failed the test to get on the show five times. What's the and, test like? Uh, at the time, at least in 1995, six and seven, uh, it was uh, 50 questions and you had to get some unknown number 35 of them correct in order to have a, uh, uh, then get it to play in the practice game and they would get to evaluate whether or not you could speak in simple declarative sentences and so on. And uh, uh, if, you, if you're suddenly handing out propaganda during the test game, they know not to have you on the show. So uh, I went uh, five times and my degree is electrical engineering and applied physics, which is not on the show. And I'm sitting there with people who graduated with liberal arts degrees. And so all the questions about Shakespeare and history and all these things that at that time I knew very little about. I would not have been able to find Beirut on a map. I had no idea. Uh, and I, I, got, I got smoked every time I went in. And I gave up and finally went back one more time because you know they give away free money. I live in Los Angeles, so I give it a shot. They'd like to try every six months, they change the test. So I went and um, passed, oh my God. And then I went through the little practice game and that went well and they said, well, maybe we'll call you. Six months go by, I don't think anything of it. And I get a phone call saying, uh, hey, you're on in three weeks. Oh, uh -huh. and then it dawns on me that, wait a minute, I'm gonna be playing against a bunch of people who passed the test on the first try. I'm gonna get humiliated on national television. And I'm driven by fear and shame. 
I'm driven by just the terror of public shaming. You know, it's just like, who needs that? Or I was at the time. So um, I had three weeks. So the first thing I did is I spent the first week and a half uh, getting every book I could out of the library about memory skills, about how the brain works, about everything that was known at the time about neuroanatomy and, and, and memory storage and hippocampus and amygdala and all the little tiny structures in the brain, how they work. And tried to boil it all down as fast as I could into um, useful skills. And then I used, spent about a week and a half then uh, with books written by former Jeopardy champions about the stuff they crammed for the show. And basically loaded in those books and showed up at the show with a, like in the Matrix when uh, Neil opens his eyes and goes, I know Kung Fu. It was a little bit like that. I showed up and I knew the novels of Henry James. And I showed up and I swear <laughs> to God. And I'm, I was winning in runaways. I just started crushing people. And it was three weeks. So here's the trick. And you have to be willing to be really playful with it. Our memories are the, the structures in our brain that decide whether or not we're going to remember something or it'll just disappear into the ether. Do not care whether you want to know a thing whether you are motivated, how important it is to you. That's why rote learning doesn't work. That's why we stress and study and stare, it doesn't work. They want to keep you alive. Your brain exists to keep you alive. It's a basic survival function. You are a wild animal that has learned to walk on your hind legs, nothing more, get, get over yourself. And so what your brain cares about is primal stuff, sex, violence, food, survival issues, bathroom things, anything that involves survival. And if it's, if it's big and it's vivid and involves movement and bright colors, it gets our attention, right? That's why the evening news looks the way that it does. So if you want to remember, um, oh, let's see, one of, the, one of the examples I use in the book, actually, and now I have to reconstruct it and remember it live on camera, um, the uh, uh, E.M. Forrester, the novels of E.M. Forrester. I've never read any of them. I do not have time. I've never gotten to it. I'm sure they're fantastic. I needed to know them for the show. All right, so I have a long, like a list of titles and I need to find a way to link them together. The way to do it is just pretend you're eight years old and an immature little eight year old and make up the silliest visuals and jokes and whatever you can and stuff just goes right in. So when I came up with, um, okay, E.M. Forrester, 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 it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lumberjack, it's a logger, okay. So we have a hero, we have a protagonist. Okay, so I have to link all these titles, E.M. Forrester, uh, let's see, it's, um, uh, uh, there's a, a room with a view. Okay, so he builds a log cabin up in the big forest with a big picture window, big giant room, room with a view. Um, uh, uh, where angels fear to tread is one of the things. Okay, so now we have to put sin in the big room. Okay, because angels don't want to go in there. So I turned this place into this like wild disco orgy. The visuals in my head are fantastic right now. Um, uh, then there's a, a, a Howard's End was one of them. Okay, I have this friend named Howard. It's actually the guy I helped on, on Millionaire. Howard's End, what could this be? Uh, so I pictured Howard's End 30 feet large in the picture window. All right. And let's see, a passage to India. Where would that be? Hmm. All I can say is if you look at Howard's End, you can see the Taj Mahal. So now you have to be like eight years old to laugh at that but you will now remember that image for the rest of your freaking life yeah. because it's primal. And I did that. And as soon as I really learned how to do this for myself, it all of a sudden got to be fun. I mean, just anything can go in. You sit there and you just invent stuff and play and make yourself snicker like a child and no one else has to know what's going on in your head. And I was able to start loading stuff in to this day. Here's a trick if you're at business meetings and you need to remember people's names. You need to, like you're meeting a hundred people and shaking their hand and you glance at the ID and we've all, you know, it just goes in and out all the time. And I still do it too. It's normal. I, I'm not paying attention. If you want something active to do to remember somebody's name, you kill them with it in your head, okay? If someone's name is Doug, take a shovel, dig a hole in their forehead, right? That's pretty, you, that's that's pretty you, morbid. Yeah, oh. <laughs> but you'll remember it. That's how our brains actually work. And we yeah. can judge it or we can yeah. use it. Try it. You right. will actually be secretly having a great time at the party. And it also kills social anxiety because <laughs> you're no longer really concerned about anything, but the little fun, little joy you're having in your head as you walk around and, and you, you know, run into people and you know, Oh, Hey, Stu. And you remember that because you boiled that guy. 
yeah. you know, or, or whatever. And it's actually, you know, I, I did a talk in Atlanta. There was 1,100 people there um, and all the people that I had to meet and everything. And then afterwards, the woman who was hosting came up. Her name was Butch for some reason. And she asked me in front of the 1,100 people, how do you remember, how did you remember my name? And when I met her, I didn't remember it the way you might think. I thought of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid and mm -hmm. the end of the movie. Uh, basically, I killed her with the Bolivian Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and it never had a problem remembering her name ever since. And to this day, you know, a year later, I still remember her name. So anyway, that's how memory works. Uh, there's much more to it, of course, but that's the thumbnail version. And it, it can transform your life then because anything you want to learn, foreign languages, uh, it just you can start putting it in. And my life's been amazing ever since. No, that's, that's awesome. And I did read, um, although I didn't read Trebekah Stan, when I read reviews, people had written on Amazon. Mm. People uh, talked about how you had made this science interesting mm. and the mechanics of memory <laughs> and learning and how it was potentially very dry information that you had brought to life. And I can see as you described this now, how that, how that's the case. And one thing that comes through for me, you know, of course, talking with you now and in your book, International Bank of Bob, and when I watch some of the talks that I could find of you online, it is your humor and you talk about the improv training you did with Del Close and, mm -hmm. and this. But one thing I'd love to get your perspective about is, you know, and, and I'm hearing you say that memory works better when we're playful with it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and life seems to work better when we're open and fun, like having fun and joy. It's not to say like every moment's a party, but mm -hmm. I've found this often like a tense situation, a stressful situation. If I can bring some levity to it, that it can mm -hmm. kind of unjam things. But tell me, in your experience, how much of what you would say is your current personality is something that you've consciously created and infused oh. humor into, and how much is maybe something you were biologically endowed with? What, what, what's your hmm. thought on that? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, it's really hard to say, but if, if, uh, oh, this is turning into counseling, and I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, normally, this is much more expensive for me. Um, I, I, I think everybody, I don't think there's anything special about me in this, but, but we are largely our own inventions. Um, we can make the decision, whatever the hell happened to us prior to the age of 20. I come, I won't get into it, but I come from a background that is a little bit Dickensian in its own ways. Um, it was not the most pleasant of childhoods. I'll leave it at that. And so I have stuff that I talk to a counselor with every single week and work on. And by the way, anybody watching this, as long as I've got your ears and eyeballs, nobody's ashamed to go into the gym. You're going to the gym to work on your body. You're gonna make yourself stronger. Why the hell is anybody ashamed of counseling or going to AA or going to whatever they need to? Why the, no, you're making yourself stronger. You should be proud of going to counseling, saying, you know, I'm going to get better. I'm gonna seize, I've learned from my mistakes, learn which were other people's mistakes. My God, that's how you become a better person. Do yeah. it. Be proud. Walk proud. So that, that little speech done. Um, I, I uh, uh, have a bunch of stuff that I, I work on periodically, but I made the choice to work on it. And mm -hmm. a lot of people choose not to. Whatever happened to you prior to the age of 18, the past doesn't have to be the future. Yeah. And my biggest regret in life at age 54 now is that I did not... I, you know, all the social shame and stigma and everything around counseling. I wish I'd started when I was 18. I wish I'd started sooner than that. Um, because once I really started taking apart my own issues and realizing how I am driven by X, Y, and Z that I'm not necessarily going to share on the internet. Oh, wow. I don't have to do that anymore. And it doesn't happen instantly. It takes years. It's a process. But once you really see the patterns, then well, wait a minute, I don't want to do it. And you can start changing. And so I think to some extent, I'm you know, I was sort of a creation of my own, but anybody is in, in making the choice not to work on those things. You're still creating yourself. You're just creating a version that doesn't change. We just have the choice. Yeah. And, and maybe creating a version unconsciously as opposed to, mm -hmm. you know, something you're mm -hmm. choosing. And, and well, what's really interesting is that the tools we learn as survival tools as children, um, the things that keep us alive at age 11, just become like what we see as the natural way to process the world. And most people that I've ever met don't bother to realize that maybe the tools that served you really well at 15 aren't necessarily the tools that serve you the best at 45 or at 25. And yeah. 
And that's something that should be, it's so obvious once it's said out loud. It, that should be like in the culture. We should all know that and accept that and understand that nobody gets out of adolescence alive. You know, we, we all got to work on stuff. Yeah. And, you know, that's okay. So one of the points I always try to make when I'm in front of an audience of any kind is, uh, uh, you know, if you're, because uh, it can be the most professional audience in the world. It can be a bunch of Fortune 500 people in their fancy suits, and they're all in pain. Every single one of them, I guarantee you. And we don't make room for that. It's one of the things, in our, we're all driven, and it's all this like Protestant work ethic. We're going to make the world a better place with our incredible strength. Ah, screw that. Come here, give me a hug. You know, <laughs> because that's actually where we all really are. Yeah. And we, it's, we take it home, and we do it at home, and we hide it. We, no, no, no. Come here, give me a hug. So, uh, yeah, anyway, that's my kind of harebrained answer to your question about, you know, who am I? I hope I'm over myself. I'm trying to be. Totally jumping. But I'm thinking about what you said on your business card, the purveyor of next level shit. Is that yeah. the, that's the card? Yeah. That's so the one, card. Of, one of these conversations that I've been having recently that feels like next level to me is this um, conversation about blockchain. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering from your perspective in, you know, California and as a world traveler and just mm -hmm. in the circles you move in, what, what do you know about it and what's your understanding of its impact for mm. our future? For one, let me uh, disavow any particular expertise. I only know a bunch of stuff I've read. I think it's really important as a first thing for anybody who's listening to separate um, the blockchain from Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, which are the primary means that everybody discusses. You know, the, the words are almost synonymous in, in, in public use a lot of the time. They're two completely different things. The blockchain itself is, is a technology and the Bit Bitcoins are sort of an application but to uh, and, and cryptocurrency stuff like that. So a lot of times, as soon as people talk about the blockchain, they start talking about cryptocurrencies immediately as if that's what it's about. That's the main way it's used now, but that's certainly not its, it's, it, it's, it's potential at all. It actually has massive other potential. And now on the separate subject of cryptocurrencies, I'm not a believer um, for a whole bunch of reasons we could get into. Uh, a lot of it having to do with just the sheer um, the, the energy intensiveness of uh, the mining and, 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 and the way it's done, I, it doesn't look like a sustainable ecosystem to me. But I could be wrong about that. I'm not an expert. Backing way off of that, I can be happy to listen to the people who know more than I do. The blockchain, as I understand it, uh, is a, a technology that has just very much in its infancy that due to the, uh, uh, the way it can be you know, redundantly uh, uh, stored and the way that uh, almost anything could be put on it. it see, I think governments are probably going to start cracking down like, on it as soon as they realize its potential to enable communication in secure ways that intelligence agencies can't intervene with. So I think it's actually a potential game changer in all sorts of things. It also has massive potential for abuse. You can use the blockchain to money launder. You can use the blockchain to, I mean, it's this giant secret thing. I kind of suspect that once its potential is fulfilled, people whose power will be threatened by it will do everything they can to destroy it. But that sounds really paranoid, and I know that I'm not an expert on it, so that is the complete sum total of my answer to that question. What do you think? <laughs> well, it sounds like the story of humanity's history, <laughs> what you're describing, right? Yeah, true. I true. mean, it's something I'm, I'm not an expert in either but I'm learning a bit more about. In fact, I'm hosting a dinner in just a couple of weeks to bring people together who are working in this space and not just, you know, who've heard about it from somebody or something. And just from the little that I've heard, um, you know, some people that I respect are saying, this technology has the potential to transform our world on the mm -hmm. level of the internet. And I'm like, mm -hmm. what? How is that mm -hmm. possible? And then they'll start pointing to some applications. And I think, okay, like, I don't totally get it, but I can, mm -hmm. you know, I'm willing to accept the possibility. So mm -hmm. anyway, I was just curious about your view on that. I just wish it's such a buzzy word right now. I wish I was working in Silicon Valley and I was doing running startups where you could just basically slap the word blockchain on almost anything. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm manufacturing kitchen appliances in the blockchain. <laughs> and then, you know, somebody's yeah, going to come in and go. The service warranties are going to be in blockchain administered, yeah. blockchain enabled or something. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I That's we have I uh, toothbrushes and oral hygiene in the blockchain. <laughs> you know, throw money at it, you know. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so I want to ask you a bit about your book, The International Bank of Bob. Mm -hmm. 
let's see. I know you've talked a lot about this. People listening might not have heard, but I, before I get to asking you a specific question about it, I want to share with you that your book was one of the things that inspired me to start a Kiva lending team of my own. And I wow. see the Kiva lending team of that has your name on it. I understand is one you didn't actually start yourself, right. but the right. friends of Bob Harris have started a team that I checked last night. It's the ninth most popular team, it, not just most popular, but most is le loaned the most money, just over $8 million now. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who don't know about micro lending, it's now kind of an old thing a little bit in our mm -hmm. world is, is an old thing. Mm -hmm. But to have loaned your team, the team with your name on it anyway, to have loaned more than $8 million to entrepreneurs in developing countries, $25 at a time, mm -hmm. with an astonishing repayment rate, like greater than, you know, securities here in the developed world, is, mm -hmm. is pretty remarkable. So I, I am interested to for you, if you'll just share a little bit mm -hmm. about what inspired you to write this book and who mm -hmm. did you write it for? Oh, that's an interesting question. The second part, who I wrote it for. I'll get to that second. Um, okay, what, what, I grew up, my grandfather was a Baptist minister. And uh, so I grew up with this imperative to do well in the world or else you will burn in eternal agony. So I was, I've always been motivated to do something nice, you know, to be a good, to try to be a good person. I, I'm now motivated more because it's fun. But uh, so in the middle of everything I've ever done, every point in my career, everything from doing stand up to, to, to when I, anything I've written, books, TV, whatever, I'm always thinking, okay, how is this helping? How is this doing good? Is it doing good? And if it doesn't, I actually don't function well. Like I really need to do that. So uh, I, in 2008, I was working, uh, I had lucked into a job as a luxury travel writer. Uh, I was working for, mind you, my mother worked for minimum wage. My dad worked in a, uh, a General Motors factory. Uh, my favorite food's Cheerios, as I mentioned in the book. So it's not exactly like I'm Mr. Luxury, okay? And anybody who's heard me here, I'm not, I, I'm not the guy who shows up with the white gloves and, you know, oh my God, you've got dust on your escutcheons. That's not me, right? If, if somebody explains to me a vertical wine tasting, I assume that means we're standing up when we're drinking. That's all I know about it. So, but I was hanging out with the right guy who was an editor at Forbes, and he basically all they cared about was somebody who could make their deadlines, uh, not destroy anything, not, you know, just write the damn articles. They've, they've already picked the hotels. So it was the easiest job in the entire universe. And I lived like a billionaire. My job, my job was to get on planes, fly to exotic locales, check into the five-star restaurant for free, eat the fancy meals, sleep in the fancy bed, and then write formulate 300 word uh, little internet essays, blog posts basically, confirming that yes, the St. Regis Hotel in Bali is nice. That was my job. And it was fun for a while. I won't lie, I enjoyed the, the novelty of it. The, the, just the, you know, And I, I expected at every turn that Somehow everyone would just smell the working class on me and at some point I would be busted. I'm walking into these billion dollar hotels and I, I just waited for a maitre d' somewhere to go, him, and simply grab me by the collar and pull me out. And it never happened. And I gradually started to realize, wait a minute, everybody's pretending. I mean, yes, there are actual experts, but the ones who are actual experts actually don't take it that seriously. The most knowledgeable chefs I've ever met actually just really love to cook and they're not you know the the, the, the media portrayal uh, yeah there's it jerk chefs and so on but actually the ones I've met are wonderful and, and and the people who don't really have the expertise are the ones who can be really snooty and, and terrible and frankly most of the people I met interestingly working at all these amazing hotels the hospitality industry is dominated by at least where I was, what I saw, it was mostly people from middle-class backgrounds in the developing world who had, this was their ticket out to go see the world. And uh, uh, so I was having amazing conversations about the planet with these people that I cared much more about than anything we were eating or anything in the, the building or any of the fancy stuff. So I'm connecting in a different way than I was expecting and enjoying a different thing that I was thinking about. And at the same time, you can't go to a lot of these places and not notice the huge disparity between rich and poor, which we have here, obviously. Uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, uh, the west side of Los Angeles, which is one of the nicest places in North America. And I can walk from where I'm standing to a bridge overpass 
uh, where at night there's a, a camp of 40 homeless people. Rich and poor is a thing everywhere. It's getting much worse here. But you go to a place like Dubai, and it's a, it's a different ballgame. It's an order of magnitude. You've got a thin veneer of a luxury class, and most of the work is basically being done by people from South Asia, East Africa, and so on, who are essentially slave labor. They're working for like six bucks a day in 105 degree heat, uh, 10 hours a day. And they're doing it because they want to send some money home to their even poorer relatives back home. The reason people sign up to take these horrible jobs you've read about in Saudi Arabia or Qatar or throughout the Middle East or in Southeast Asia or any, uh, any of these boom places in the developing world, the workers who are living at a near slave le uh, level, well, that's six bucks a day. You know, if you're from a village where you, people are living on a, the equivalent of about two bucks a day, if they can send another two or three bucks a day home, that's, that's, that's money. That means something. That's a better life for their kids. All of those guys who are sweating to death building the stadiums in Qatar for the 2022 World Cup, they're doing it to make a better life for their families, nearly all of them. And when you realize that, it becomes heartbreaking and more important than anything else you can look at. And so I'm walking around Dubai and, you know, luxury hotel everywhere, and the novelty's worn off. And I'm questioning the purpose of what I'm doing. And uh, I came across these four guys at the side of the street on Sheikh Zayed Road who were workers who were freaking exhausted at the end of a brutal day and had missed their ride back to the labor camp where they sleep 10 to a head. And meanwhile, I, as the travel writer up in my hotel room, have all of the free stuff you give to travel writers. My, I, my bed is covered in food. There's a giant spread of like fresh fruits and sparkling date juice and just candy and just everything that they give. And some of it's actual food. And I looked at these guys and I just couldn't go back up to my room and, you know. So I, I went up to my room, I, I got a backpack, I shoveled everything I could into the backpack. Mostly to like salve my own conscience, to be honest. Went downstairs, found the guys, and one of them gave me a little nod, a little smile, like, hey, hi. And I sat down with them. And I, that was crossing a major threshold. That was a huge moment. That was one of the biggest moments of my life. I sat down with them. I opened the backpack. And we didn't have a language in common, but I just started sharing. And they, I was wondering how that would go over. Would that feel weird to them? Would that feel condescending? Would I, you know, is it whatever? No, they were just really happy to eat. They were really happy and really appreciated it. And I felt great. They felt great. It was a really great thing. We hung out for like 45 minutes and it was like this amazing picnic at the side of this highway in the middle of Dubai. And I wanted more of that in my life and had no idea how to get it. Meanwhile, I'm running around to the billion dollar hotels. And right about that time, just as that was happening, a little bit before, Kiva uh, was creating crowdsourcing which is the thing now everybody thinks of as this normal thing. You go to GoFundMe or you go to all of these different crowdsourcing things. Kiva actually created that. They invented that. Uh, Kiva, uh, there's a, a couple of wonderful people were in the Bay Area and uh, people just like you and me, they were not, they did not have major funding. They didn't have some giant backer. There was no, it was just the guy who did most of the work founding Kiva, uh, my friend Matt, he was a software engineer at TiVo. He's just working a regular white collar job in the Bay Area. Uh, Kiva's name actually was chosen. He worked at TiVo, which was catchy. And he looked for a word that sounded memorable in the same length. That's how Kiva got its name. And uh, they were creating a, a means of crowdsourcing the financing of small mom and pop businesses in the developing world. Uh, this was inspired by the work of Muhammad Yunus in Bangladesh, that's a whole digression. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for transforming the economy of a lot, for millions of people in Bangladesh. So this spread around the world and then they wanted a way to crowdsource that so that you and me and everybody else could put all our money together in little small pieces and help Simon in Kenya who needs to finance a cow, uh, which is asset financing. It's exactly like buying a car, actually. And, uh, or you know, any of, the, any of these different, different uh, shopkeepers and business owners. I came across Kiva. I looked at it. I didn't know if it worked. There wasn't a lot of peer-reviewed research. But I knew that I wanted to do something and that if we want to help the lives of these workers in Dubai, the answer isn't in Dubai. 
it's making their lives better in India. It's making their lives better in Sri Lanka and wherever they're from. So it's addressing the root of the problem. If the local economy was better, they wouldn't have taken these horrible jobs. So I got super interested in it and just started um, a few loans, a few more, a few more. And then I mentioned it to a book agent and uh, suggested the idea that maybe I would just do a book where I followed the money. And I went out to go visit these clients uh, all over the world and just would ask them, well, does this help? Does this actually work? How would it work better? What do you need? What doesn't work? And um, that turned into a four year, pro I thought it would maybe be a year of my life and it turned into a little bit more than four years of traveling to five continents and visiting God knows how many people um, and showing up at the door in Tanzania. Hi, my name is Bob. I'm from Los Angeles and I came here to see how your woodworking business is. Hi, can I come in? And they would look at me and they'd look at the translator and basically go, well, uh, okay. And in 10 minutes, I'm playing with the kids and, uh, you know, sharing my own stories and making friends. And I learned a hell of a lot about microfinance and I learned a hell of a lot about the planet. I wrote a book that tries to cover all of that territory. That was a long answer to a short question. I, I, I hope it answered, answered in full. No, that's definitely <clears throat> the background, you know, answers like, why you wrote the book and how and one thing that if I remember correctly from International Bank of Bob you shared not only did you see the plight of these workers and the contrast of the poverty and the wealth but you actually took the greater portion of the money that you were paid for that luxury writing assignment and mm -hmm. that was what you used which wasn't mm -hmm. a ton of money but it was the no, large no. amount Right. Yeah, I used the whole nest egg. I used the whole twenty grand. Yeah, I still had some money from Jeopardy and other projects. It wasn't like I'm poor or starving or whatever, but it seemed like the right amount. It was sort of like, okay, this. It was more than tithing. It was certainly more than that. But like, I got to see the planet on a five star level, and I kind of don't deserve to. Like, I, I, I don't know who deserves to. Honest to God, there's such a bird lottery. Yeah. In 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 a in a saner world, I, I don't have the solution. I don't know what the perfect economic system is. I'm not an ideologue. I have no idea. But the idea that we somehow over the last several centuries, humankind has developed a system whereby an infinitesimally small number of people have everything. I mean like everything. And then there's a very small sliver of people who live pretty well and their biggest worry is, is who's gonna win the game on Friday. And then the overwhelming mass of humanity is struggling, working at a, 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 a pretty difficult level. And then there's a giant chunk at the bottom that doesn't even have clean water. And that's insane. It shouldn't have to, like, we're smart enough to fix that, aren't we? Are we good enough human beings? Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's, it's, it, it, it's astonishing. And honestly, it, I, I wish there was more I knew to do. Uh, the Kiva thing is is what I do. It's what I know how to do. It's what I figured out. It's, 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 it's how I can try to play my part. If everybody had something, I think it would help. Um, but yikes. Who did you write the book for? Oh, yeah, 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 that part. Um, primarily to people who were already uh, members of, people who were already interested in Kiva or had heard of microfinance uh, was the primary audience because at that time, I mean, Kiva's, it's, become a pretty big deal. There's millions of lenders and so on. It was primarily for them, but that was the publisher's thinking and, and what Kiva certainly didn't mind. For me, I, I though, it became much more about trying to write it for a lay audience, uh, anybody who wanted to travel the world vicariously. What is it like, you know, when you go to the Philippines and instead of going to the beach, you actually go into the village and go hang out with the people in there. You know, what is it like in, uh, in Rwanda now, you know, if you want to do the vicarious travel thing. So I, I, more and more as I was, as I was working on it, it became more about trying to share the world and not write about microfinance as much. Mm. How has its reception uh, been and how does that compare against any hopes or even expectations mm. you had for it? Oh, thanks. Thanks for asking. Um, the, the book actually did really well. Uh, it went to number three worldwide on Amazon on the day of release and, and, it had its period in, in 2013 when it was released. It was kind of a big deal for a few months, and there were articles all over the press, and the New York Times and San Francisco Chronicle and stuff, which was really fun. I mean, that was, that was neat. Uh, and that Friends of Bob Harris team, I can always look at and see, okay, here's people who read the book, 
and they've lent millions of dollars and okay, that's done good. So I, I sleep well at night, but there is a, you know, I, I never had a fantasy that I would write this book and it would suddenly change the world. Um, but you know, it, it's, 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 we're all small creatures, you know, and, and so you can put years of your life into a thing and it will have an effect and it, inevitably it'll never quite match up to your giant dreams. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what I actually wanted it to have done. Um, it did everything it was supposed to do and it's, it still does. So I still get emails from people every day, but I'll be honest with you. I, I mean, there are still, you know, every day I read the news and, and there's stories of, you know, more people will have died constructing the stadiums for the World Cup soccer in 2020 in Qatar than died in 9-11. Wow. And they're being worked to death simply to build these stadiums. And that hasn't changed. That hasn't gone away. So there's a part of me that as long as that is still the reality of how so much of the world works, it it's not like spitting in the ocean and it didn't rise. No, actually the water rose perceptibly, but still not enough. There's still people out there hurting and it's very hard to feel super proud of what I have accomplished when it's still, I mean, it's, it's the first few steps on a, a long journey that will continue long after I'm gone. Yeah, there's so much need in the world. And as you said, like everyone's in pain which is interesting to distinguish between pain and suffering, you know, mm -hmm. and how much we create for ourselves and, and that kind of thing. But one thing is I, so actually two things that come up as I hear you share about this one, I love that Matt, you know, working at TiVo did so much of this programming, you know, as an individual and really did create or, you know, foster something that didn't exist, this crowd funding and doing well and impacting many people, many millions of people around the globe. Mm -hmm. And your work as an individual, you know, writing the book, sharing your experience, um, encouraging and inviting others. And I know it can be easy, certainly for myself, and I think for many people to think that, oh, we're just one person and what can I do? And the need is so great. You know, my life is insignificant in that. And so that kind of goes back full circle to, you know, our lives mm -hmm. take on meaning to the degree that our love and our actions or our beliefs and our actions are congruent. I, I love that perspective. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, by the way, anybody who's listening to this, and if you're thinking, um, I'm just one person, come on, I'm driving to work, uh, you know, get out of my brain. If there's that thought of like, geez, it's so big and what can I do? And, and well, the thing is, we never see the ripple effects of what we do. This is really super important. People have so much more power than they realize too. This is what I used to keep remind myself. Remember a minute ago when I was telling you about when I started getting involved in Kiva, before I started Kiva, when I was in Dubai and I came across these workers at the side of the street and wanted to do something, got a bunch of food, came down, and one of them gave me a little nod and a smile and welcomed me. And so I sat down. That is a really key moment with an enormous life lesson. In it. This is one of the most important things I've ever come across in my life and is so hopeful. I mean, think about who that guy is in that moment. He is, a, is it does not exactly have the political power that you or I or anyone listening to this does. He's a guy who's working it's nearly slavery. It's an indentured servitude, sort of. He's, you know, he's sitting on the side of a road, but he had, still had kindness in his heart. And he saw a guy with a kind of open look on his face like mine, I imagine. And, uh, and just greeted me, he gave me this little nod. Now, I, in that moment, didn't know how to cross that threshold. I don't know how to just like walk up to total strangers who don't even speak the same language and say, hi, I have bananas, would you like some? Am I, you know, I, I don't, I've never done that before. I don't know how to do that. I'm wading into a new territory yeah. and I'm honestly inside a little scared. Like what's going to happen here? Are they going to be mad at me? Are they going to, you know, and he welcomed me. He gave me that look in that moment, in that tiny moment when he just acted in a decent, kind human fashion and looked up at me and smiled. He made that safe. I sat down. I had that day with them that, that 45 minutes. And then, um, and then went on my, on my way with my life in the way that it developed afterwards. And I am convinced, in retrospect, without any doubt at all, that that little smile of his, I probably wouldn't have sat down otherwise. And that little smile is now rippling in its ripple effects through the rest of my life. And now yours as you're listening to this. And honestly, everything else I do uh, is, is probably influenced by that. We, and, and he will never know that. This yeah. is key. He will never know the ripple effects of his smile. It is entirely possible that 
today, when you wait for when you get on a bus or you uh, uh, you just smile at a person in a coffee shop or whatever, and they're having a bad day, you, we actually change each other constantly. We're silly, but we're these 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 kind of open creatures wobbling around the planet. We influence each other greatly. Just being kind in your ordinary day, even if you change nothing else, making a focused effort to be kind you will start changing other people's days and possibly their lives in ways you'll never understand and never see. But think of this guy in Dubai. It's real. It's a real effect. Yeah. And that, and, and then it starts, that, that is, those are the training wheels. That's, the, that, that's getting the flywheel up to speed. You get in that habit and then you start connecting to people more and, and then your own life will start getting changed in unexpected ways you can be open to. Uh, yes, you you will change the world. It's just a question of what you're going to change it to. Yeah, and, yeah, and even even when we don't see it or we don't know. The other thing that, that comes up for me in hearing what you're sharing and talking about the need in the world and the disparity that, or the pain in the world is this idea. I think about the quote that I've read online attributed to E.B. White, hmm. who talks about some mornings he wakes up and he doesn't know whether to save the world or savor the world. <laughs> this mm. makes planning the day difficult. What's your view on the balance between that? I mean, obviously being poor or suffering ourselves doesn't enrich anyone. It doesn't serve anyone. And yet this balance between serving and giving, but not like over giving or over caring, I've learned this even this term. How do you personally navigate that in, in this society that we live in? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. And it's, it's kind of in the back of everybody's minds when you're trying a new way of being good. Uh, it's, it, there's a weird lowering of one's own boundaries and a sense of, is this safe? And can I put the boundary back up? And where should that boundary be? And if you're a sensitive person, you live with that every day. You know, I, I live in a neighborhood where if I go to the Walgreens on the corner, there will be a homeless guy who needs help right there. And Every day, I'm always like, okay, do I give money? Do I just smile? Do I, I, I'll treat him like a human being for sure. But then like, how do I help? How much do I help? And if I get really involved with this, I could literally spend the rest of my life trying to help this one guy down the street. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously that's probably not the, the optimal use of my life or my time. And I don't have a, a set perfect pat answer on that. It's, these are, it's a million daily judgment calls, obviously. Um, but what I would want to point out is that okay, one of the things that we're afraid of is that we're afraid of being changed in the transaction. We are aware that, well, look, when I sat down with those guys in Dubai, I was changed by it. We're aware of the possibility that we're going to have to challenge our own assumptions and our own, everything we believe about ourselves. We will change as who we are in that interaction. And so then the boundaries come up and that's scary. Well, I did a TED talk, by the way, you can Google my name, Bob Harris, TEDx, and, and, and see the TED talk where I'll go on at length about this. My own story actually should encourage people to be a little bit bolder about how much they're willing to dive in for others and make that a priority, as opposed to just working for our own careers or whatever. In my, in my case, I am sort of the worst case scenario for somebody with no training, no real understanding of the emotional stuff he was going to go through. Just somebody out there with a kind of a crazy do-gooder mission leaping into, I mean, I went to Bosnia and Cambodia and Rwanda and I went, I, it was a post-genocide world tour where I met people in the worst level of distress and people, I just, I, wow, did I dive in to the deep end. And if you listen to me, I'm fine. I'm okay. I had a difficult time afterwards. I did need some more counseling after that. That was hard. It was hard, but I'm fine. It is, it, 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 so if there's a part of you holding back from doing it out of fear of whatever it is that you may have in mind, I have already been down the road. It's not that bad. You're going to be a little changed, but it'll be for the good. But some of your question is also about like the balance between, you know, working for ourselves, working for our own bank account. It's not good. We can't help other people other people if we're not okay. It's a little bit like putting the oxygen mask on the child, uh, on yourself before you put it on the child. Here. Yeah. You've got to put your own oxygen mask on. Well, yes, that's fundamental. So in a way, being able to work for others, help others is a luxury. It's, it's, if you're already working four jobs, you know, trying to put food on the table for the kids, 
hey, you know what? You're creating children. That's pretty, that's fantastic. And screw me, don't listen to me. You're doing amazing work right there. You know, I don't mean to preach to you. But if somebody has uh, the luxury of even thinking about this choice, if you are at a place in your life, wherever, whatever your economic level is, where you even start thinking about this stuff, gosh, I could be doing more. Yeah, you probably could actually. The fact you're even having that thought. Yeah. I haven't met, I didn't meet a lot of people in um, some of the poorer places that I went to who were thinking to themselves, golly, I should be doing Meals on Wheels. You know, because they're, 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 they're busy. They, they're just trying to get through the day. They're working 12 hour days in the fields. You're, if, but if you're having that thought, yeah, you can, you, can, you can probably do a little more. By the way, that said, I got to tell you, some of the most generous human beings I've ever met are the people that I've met in the scariest of places. You know, you, you walk into, you see on TV these, you know, teeming slums and they look really scary. You know what? You can't function on the equivalent of two bucks a day without having a pretty good sense of community and having some sense of, they've actually developed financial instruments inside those slums that, are, that, that, that mirror and reflect the ones that we have out here in the, in the, in the so-called first world. And yes, there's crime and, and all that other stuff and tremendous stress, but some of the most generous, thoughtful, aware of others people I've ever met in my life have been people who are living lives that would challenge, I, I don't know how I get through a week of it and they get through it with their big hearts. Yeah. So you've seen yeah. many things. Let me transition now to asking you a few questions of a totally unrelated nature. So unrelated to writing, unrelated to your past um, sure. work necessarily. So please complete the following sentence with something, <laughs> other, with something other than a box of chocolates. Okay. Life is like a... Uh, confusing endurance sport. <laughs> okay. All right. What else? Uh, what do you wish you were better at? Mm, besides answering these questions, <laughs> um, I, I wish I was. Wow, there's a lot. I'm trying to give you a, 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 a particular answer. I wish I, I wish I had been better in my past. I, it's not that I wish that I was better at anything right now. I'm actually pretty happy with a lot of my life. I wish I had been better at listening to other people uh, for about the first 40 years of my life. If you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? Uh, um, please do not recycle. Um, uh, me, it's just a joke. If found, please drop in the nearest mailbox. I, I've, I've always joked, I have a dumb, bunch of dumb jokes for that. Um, by the way, my actual epitaph, this is really true. I have insisted to everyone who knows me that when I go, I want my epitaph to say, finally, I get into real estate. <laughs> uh, but what, what t-shirt would I wear all the time? Um, I, you know, it, so many people, there's so much noise in everybody's head all the time. I would probably write something, it would probably just be a t-shirt that said, things are not as bad as you think. All right. All right, next question. What book? other than your own, have you gifted or recommended most often? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, not one specific book, really. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of the writer, Bill Bryson. Um, so I've gifted a lot of his books to different people as appropriate. I think George Orwell's 1984 is a pretty much a documentary. Although actually Aldous Huxley had it better because we're much more doing that. Um, yeah, what books do I give, give to people? Um, that's an interesting, it just, it depends on the person. Cause you know what, when you give somebody, I, I can't give you one answer to that. When you give somebody a book, it's, it's actually, a, this is what I think you are going to be interested in. It's this huge statement about who a person is. So I don't give books lightly at all. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, if, if somebody gives me a book that I actually really want to invest the time in reading, I feel like they know me and I love them more. Yeah. And so I try to do the same for, uh, uh for others. Yeah, I don't really have an answer to that. Sorry. All right. You're very thoughtful. Okay. Uh, I know you actually have a page on your website about this. So maybe you can tell mm -hmm. me that we can point people to that link as well. And I'll include it in the show notes. Obviously, you travel a ton. But what's, if you picked one 
one travel hack, something you do or maybe something mm. you take with you that makes your travel less painful and or more enjoyable. What mm. is that thing? Surprisingly, uh, duct tape uh, is, uh, it, it's, I always have a role with, I've used that to close wounds, to repair backpacks, uh, broken shoelaces, tape the shoe, duct tape. I, I cannot tell you how many times in my life I've had something that never happened to me before in the middle of some place I've never been. What am I going to do? Oh, duct tape. <laughs> just, <laughs> just takes care of it. Yeah. What's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Hmm. Great question. Um, I cleaned up my diet. Uh, uh, it's a huge thing. Um, I ate like a teenager for the first 50 years of my life. And I, I always ate, I, I gave up red meat when I was in my twenties, but, uh, uh, I would snack at all hours. And when I was writing, I would, you know, I'm thinking really hard. My brain needs blood sugar. I'll take another snack. And in the last few years, I've, I've gotten much, much more serious about my diet and it makes an enormous difference that and breathing, uh, which is kind of in vogue right now, but breathing properly, yeah. better posture. Yeah. Breathing is amazing. Everybody should try it. <laughs> I agree. There's a, there's a, you know what? Back to the book recommendations. There's a book I actually want to recommend called Breathe um, that is about how to breathe better. Um, and I, I, I Just Google that. You'll find the right book. I, uh, it's uh, Actually, I have it right here. Hold on. Okay. It's on, actually on my desk. Uh, it's a woman named uh, Dr. Belissa Vranich, V-R-A-N-I-C-H. How did this book, how did you come across this book? You know what? I'm actually not certain. Um, I think, oh, you know what? I, uh, I have some health issues that I want to get into. Um, and I was just Googling everything I could do about them that could help. Came across it and I thought, well, you know, it's not going to be expensive anyway. And uh, uh, it, it's wonderful. Every time I do these exercises, I feel so much better. And I can actually feel that I am starting to, to like, my mood is, is, is elevated. And yes, get the book, breathe. Awesome. It's not like the whole thing's not a sales pitch for her, her next seminar or something. <laughs> um, she does have those, I mean, but um, actually she, surprisingly enough, in one of the early chapters, it, it, she actually explicitly says, does this, can this book actually replace working with me at a seminar? Yes, exclamation point. That's so great. Um, so yeah, and I, I kind of believe it because I'm not going to her seminars, but I love the book. Uh, what's one thing you wish every American knew? At the risk of pissing off 38% of America, I would, I wish America knew that there are about 200 other countries and that we are only one of them. And that once you leave America's borders, things get worse or better depending on what direction you're going in. And a lot of the world is way the hell ahead of us in so many ways. I will tell you straight up, I feel much more comfortable and much more at home in anywhere in Western Europe, in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, any developed country other than the US, really. Why do you think that is? Uh, the gun culture here is insane. The religiosity of the culture is insane. The, uh, the inability to understand that Healthcare is something that, like, we shouldn't have to lose your house for getting sick. And most, it, it's like the rest of the world has that figured out. There are developing countries that have that worked out. Yeah. And, it, 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 and, and in America, these ideas are considered like radical and far left and all of that. Yeah, or socialism. All right. Yeah. And that word is just thrown around without anybody having any idea what it even really means. I've never heard, I, I have not used the word socialism used in its actual meaning, uh, you know, worker control of the means of production it, ever. In America, it's just a it's just a name to call people communist, socialist, atheist, whatever. Yeah. Um, just to denounce ideas out of hand. Actually, no. You want to see? Okay. Australia. Um, I was given permanent resident status in Australia last year, um, and I spent a lot of my time down there. Um, and in Australia, they gave me the health card or the, the 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 forms to fill out for the health card the day after they gave me the visa. Wow. At the time I'm in my I'm in my fifties. There was no further medical examination. It was a right. You were a permanent resident, not even a citizen yet, a permanent resident. You get sick, here's the doctor. And they figured out how to fund it. And the country's not bankrupt. They're not in heavy debt. It looks and walks and acts like America. But if I get sick there, I go to the doctor and I go to the doctor that day. And I wish Americans knew that the rest of the world has things figured out that we don't. Yeah. What's your next big project? I've got three or four of them. 
that a year from now we'll be able to say, that's what I was talking about, that thing. But Well, I hope those all turn out. That's, that's really exciting. I, it turns out I wrote uh, and actually pitched um, a screenplay to a couple different studios within the last year. I have a friend yeah. who's a writing partner for yeah. me. And uh, so we went to Apple and we went to Hulu and, and this, um, they all passed, unfortunately. But uh, I have a sense of the thrill of, you know, but it's a process, isn't it? I mean, the whole thing, the relationships and the pitching and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nothing ever really gets made. I'm amazed that anything actually gets produced ever. I maybe shouldn't bring this up, but Hollywood's like a pit of vipers with more vipers. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Your yeah. statement. It's, it's, it's a line in Trebekistan, actually. Hollywood is like a pit of vipers, but with more vipers. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. I love that. I had forgotten that joke. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's, it, you know what? That's true, except for the people who are really successful are yeah. almost always over themselves. And it, it's not because they got there and then once they were successful, suddenly developed emotional maturity. Yeah. What I found is that the people who actually have themselves together on the inside and are, they actually wind up being able to walk right through the nest of vipers and, and remain kind of untouched. It's, 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 it, there's this weird zen to it. And honestly, I truly believe to you that part of the reason that I'm suddenly getting meetings with people whose names I won't drop, but my God, that, 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 that all these things are happening now in a career that I struggled with for many years is that honestly, I did a lot of counseling. I went out, I did a lot of work in the world. I, I got over myself, I hope. Uh, I, I'm not about me, if I can avoid that. But saying this after talking to you for hours, but about my life. <laughs> but I asked, I asked, yeah. let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but truthfully, it's, and people can sense that. And so you get into a, a, a room at one of the big agencies or one of the big studios or something, and you're pitching an idea. And people, we, we communicate non-verbally constantly, and people can smell in the room if there's need or insecurity, if you really know what you're doing or you really don't or whatever. Yeah. And, and now I'm kind of at a place in my life where I sort of am not attached to any of it. I believe in all of it. I'm passionate about it, but I also know that you know, I'm not working for six bucks a day. I'm fine. Yeah. And it's just transformative to my career. Uh, the charity work made everything else better. Yeah. Well, and I, yeah, I suspect, and it was a word I didn't hear you use, but authenticity also, mm. you know, that people get a sense of that pretty immediately. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if people want to learn more from you or connect with you, what should they do? Oh, okay. Well, I have a website, uh, bobharris.com, that I haven't updated in five years. So uh, it's still actually the front page of the site is about the Kiva book and so on. But you can find some stuff there. Um, I'm, I don't have a big online profile. I would recommend if you want to know more about me, read my books. Find them on Amazon, read them. Um, you can track me down on Instagram, but that's, do you really want to see what I ate for lunch? No, I can't imagine. I want to recommend that what anyone would want to learn from me you've probably already heard except some stuff about writing that I would really want to share. Um, people think of writing as this uh, kind of artistic process. No, it's engineering. You put your butt in the chair and you make stuff, you work. And if you want to be a really good writer, it's not about the writing. It's about who you are. It's about engaging with people and listening because what you do is you're telling stories and you can't tell stories unless you're, know lots of different people so you in, in different points of view to be a terrific writer you have to be able to not be you while you're writing imagine yourself literally in the shoes of the characters you're writing about and that's only going to happen if you develop the empathy bone the empathy muscle by going out and interacting with people all damn day and you'll learn enough that's that's one of the biggest things live your life and then the writing comes you're not going to write a great novel at age 25. You're just not. Um, no. But live your life. Uh, and, and that will read everything. It's all valuable. Uh, and then over time. And then can I, can I give you a, 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 a very basic um, thing that I, I just taught yeah, uh, writing at the International Film School in Cologne, Germany for two months. And I had to formulate everything I know about storytelling. And I actually want to give you a very short, really useful mnemonic or any, anytime you're writing a script, if you're working on one, you, you're your co-writer, you're going back and pitching at Apple or something. If you want to see whether your story, your acts, your scenes, if everything works or not, here's your checklist. Here's how to tell. This is really effective. This really works. It's the best thing I ever came up with. Imagine you're watching television and you want to find something really riveting. 
that's going to just get your attention and be an amazing story in the next two minutes. It's not going to be something you just, you're flipping through the channels, there's news, there's a soap opera, whatever, and then all of a sudden you come across a singularly transfixing image of a parachutist with the ground approaching, desperately trying to open their parachute. You will probably stop flipping channels for a couple of minutes to see how this turns out. And here's why. That image contains every important element of storytelling and nothing else. You have a clear protagonist who we empathize with. We don't have to really know that much about them, but we definitely empathize about the predicament. We have a very clear goal. It's amazing how many stories lose the empathetic protagonist or do not have clarity of goal throughout in every scene and every step. We have a very clear goal. We have stakes. We know why it matters. In this case, it's obviously life and death. It doesn't have to be for stories. It's not life and death in Little Miss Sunshine or, or Juno or uh, any of those sorts of movies. But we know the stakes and they do matter. They can just be emotional stakes, but here there's life and death stakes. We know what success looks like, the open parachute. We know what failure looks like, splat. We know what we're looking for. We understand that the hero has to use his or her uh, 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 skills to overcome clear and well understood obstacles on the path. Got to get the grip cord pulled. Okay, it's jammed. I got to get rid of the primary chute, get untangled, open the secondary. We will understand every step in the saga and why it's being done. Again, clarity of goal, creating secondary goals that we understand. And then we even, and this is a little bit of a bonus, we have a, a clock. We, we know that the ground is coming. We can put an altimeter on the person's wrist and know exactly where we are in the story. In much the same way that you're watching a two hour movie and you know that you're halfway into it and you have a sense of where you are in the story. If you have these elements in your overarching story, in your episodes, in your scenes, even your acts, all of these elements are present and your characters are all trying to open their own parachutes and surprising each other in the process, you're probably doing some pretty damn good writing. If you are bored when you're watching a movie, if you are bored watching a TV show, or you're not sure why you're not interested, use the parachute checklist, run through. Do I sympathize with the protagonist? Do I empathize? If not, do I know what the goal is? Or I'm feeling lost. This is, when these elements are missing, that's when stories wander. And if you look back at any of the great movies you've ever watched, you always know where you are in the story. Anyway, so that's my little rant about the fundamentals of story. Um, I would love this to become uh, the, the Harris metaphor of story. It's, yeah. it's resilient as hell. It really works. Yeah, it, it's in that one little image, it conveys so much and you've elucidated like these points, you know, out of it that I think are very powerful and they're all is very descriptive. So oh, thanks. thanks. Yeah, what, how do you frame it? And what do you call it? Oh, you know, I, I don't know. I just it's it's Her Bob Harris's parachute metaphor. <laughs> okay. Uh, it now has an official name, but that is that is that's. By the way, you know what's not missing there is an, it, not present. People think you need is an antagonist. There is no Joker to the Batman in that parachute thing. There's yeah. no uh, Darth Vader, and that's okay. There's no antagonist in the movie Gravity except Gravity. There's yeah. you can tell stories without a normal. Actually, if you go through a lot of the big box office runaway hits that had like a $10 million budget and made bazillions of money, bazillions of dollars, there's often no antagonist at all. It's not an essential to storytelling. Yeah. You know, there's, there's so much that people... Have. Also, you know what else Hollywood has wrong? Is that you have to have a hero who has to overcome an internal obstacle. They, they have to... Some flawed character that then has to, um, you know, get past his learning disability or get past his just being an asshole. Um, no, no, that's so not necessary. What's the deep character flaw in Luke Skywalker? I mean, there isn't one. He's whiny. That's it. Uh, what's the deep character flaw in uh, the the kid in Slumdog Millionaire? The he just loves this girl. As yeah. his, there's no character flaw, and we dive in, and here's why. We all we're all heroes of our own stories. We all think of ourselves as flawless and 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 well intended. And, and we all, our primary goal is expanding the amount of love in our lives. We go to a movie theater and we sit down to a movie like Juno or Sideways or any of these sudden runaway hits. And all of a sudden there's a protagonist who is not being pursued by some Joker-like antagonist that we don't really have in our lives, but is simply a really good human being trying to deal with an issue and expand the amount of love in their lives. We look at that and we go, oh, that's me. 
and we invest and all of a sudden, you know, you, you, a movie like The Big Sick, where there's no antagonist, you have a very decent person in the center of the movie just looking to put love in their life and it took a $15 million budget and made 150 or something. Yeah. That's such a big thing. And Hollywood doesn't have that one figured out yet, which amazes yeah. me. Yeah. Anyway. And these indie, indie films like that, or I guess Amazon did that film. But okay. So the question I want to ask about writing just here at the conclusion of our time is what advice do you have for people who are maybe at the very beginning of a project or they're in the middle of a project and they're really battling with their own inner critic what advice mm -hmm. you have for people to actually push through whatever resistance or challenges they're finding to their completion mm -hmm. and getting oh. and actually delivering something? Oh, sure. Um, first thing is know your ending and make sure it's something you're passionate about wanting to say. If uh, with the film script that I'm working on has been a challenge, I've done it for a year and a half off and on. And, um, it's an adaptation of a real story. The, uh, uh, it's very complex, lots of challenges, but what I wanted to say and what the guy, the real guy's life is really about is a lesson about love wins, about in the end, if you're just present, you're just where you put your time, love wins. And it's something I really believe. And the movie that we will eventually make is going to say that really well. And in all the times that I've ever been bogged down, and I have been bogged down a lot on that one, what has always sustained me is imagining when it's done and imagining the message that I want desperately to communicate actually landing in the eyeballs of, of theater goers and, and, and people loving it. And, 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 and that's been motivating. And it's because it's, it's, it's again, the, your love and, and, and your actions, you know, congruence. I know what I want to do and why. Yeah. And structurally, a lot of times people writing a project, the ending is, by far the most important thing. There's nothing, there's nothing even close to as important. The ending is where you basically tell the world, okay, this is what this was about, go live your lives. And if your ending is, uh, 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 has, it, it is well-structured and well-designed so that you have um, all of the questions, the internal questions, the external questions, and the philosophical questions, as, as the great screenwriter Michael Arndt puts it. Um, his stuff's fantastic. Read Michael Arndt's stuff if you're interested. Uh, he wrote my little miss sunshine he's brilliant if those all wrap up in a bow kind of in one simultaneous moment uh, rocky uh for example loses the fight but he went the distance so there's the external victory he uh, uh is able to uh, prove to himself that he's a worthy fighter there's an internal victory and philosophically does a palooka like that deserve love adrian runs in and hugs him and all of the questions are resolved within seconds with that beautiful glorious ending create the ending get the ending right and then you will be driven to create the rest of it oh, that's awesome how important is it for a writer to move to the kind of locale where his craft is taking place like a aspiring screenwriter to live in california how important is that um, less important than it used to be um you know with the internet and everything i do most of my work out of the country i'm i spent the entire summer in europe and but you know email and skype and so on it, it's less important to get off the ground physically, to be present, to make the connections with agents and managers and stuff like that, take meetings and establish a reputation is important. But you could hypothetically do it from a little bit of a distance and commute in. Or, but I will also tell you this, 99% of what is submitted and written and floats around Los Angeles is garbage. It's just garbage. I mean, it's just the, I, I hate to be that blunt, but it just is. And you can tell in the first three pages, you're just reading, oh God. and and. If you write something that actually is out at the far right end of the bell curve, that is actually really great, the world beats a path to your door. I, I, I was out of the business the whole time I wrote the Kiva book. I had no connections back to, I, was, I, I just had been in Rwanda. I was busy. And nobody like suddenly moved doors and opened things for me. I had to write some stuff to show that I could create my own thing. Mm -hmm. I wrote a pilot called Nowhere, which nobody's produced, but it almost got made which is really good. I mean, not to be blunt or blow my, it's really, it's great. It's one of the better things I've, I've, I'm really proud of it. And that went out and like I had managers and agents and it's like people just swarmed. And I, like within a couple of months of writing it, I was literally sitting face to face. Chandra Grimes called me into her office and sat me down and wanted to know more about me and did I want to work for her. Wow. And and it was on the, it was what was on the page. It wasn't who I am. It wasn't white privilege. It was, it was on the page. 
And so if you write something that is fantastic on the page, people will see it. I mean, yeah. it, it, and there's money to be made. I mean, this town exists to find that and then make money on it and corrupt it and destroy it and put a Coca-Cola ad in the middle of it. But, <laughs> but it does. No, I love it. Well, I know we're, we're at our time. So I just want to conclude with two things. One is sharing okay. with you my gratitude, again, for your generosity in mm -hmm. speaking with me today and with everybody who's listening. And the second is related to that is one of the ways that I am expressing my thanks to you is that I did, um, I applied last night to join the Friends of Bob Harris Cuba Lending team. <laughs> oh, cool. I haven't heard yet if I've been approved, but oh, I expect yeah, to yeah. be. And I'm I sure did. you will be in a second. I made a, a loan, a Kiva loan on, uh, in your honor to, oh. through my Kiva lending team until I'm approved, uh, to a 29 year old woman named Sabita in West Bengal. So oh, no she's kidding. engaged in the business of selling clothes and she has a household of three members. So this will help her expand her clothing business by selling different types of shirts and pants and cotton towels and so forth. So that ripple oh, effect that you'll never see the impact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. That's really cool. Uh, one of the co-captains handles that stuff. I'm sure you'll be approved any second. Thank awesome. you for joining the team. Welcome. You are officially a friend of Bob Harris on Kiva and in real life. Yes. And if it's over, over the internet. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to me babble for 90 minutes. It was, it was, a, been, it was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, this has been great. And good on you for what you're doing with, uh, yeah, I read up on you online, of course, too, and uh, Mutual Admiration Society. More. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, I don't know when or where our paths will cross again, but I suspect they will, and I will look forward to that day. Cool. Me too. Yeah, stay in touch. Okay. Thanks, Bob. All Take right. care. Cheers. Bye. Bye.